Welcome to today's program. My guest is Terence Russoff, a Jewish man who discovers faith in Jesus. Terence, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Thank you, Terence. Where were you born? I was born in Stanmore in North London, which is um, end of the Jubilee line for anyone who's not a Londoner and wants to know where on earth that is. And I know it well because I went to school mm. there. And we I, met, we I, met I, hit each other on the bikes. We probably did because I grew up in Edgware, mm. North London as well. Uh, now, you, you're Jewish? Yes. You grew up in a Jewish home, uh, your parents Jewish. What was life like growing up within a Jewish culture and family? So I was brought up in a sort of, what we call a traditional non-Orthodox Jewish family. So that means it was sort of culturally Jewish. Um, we observed the sort of the high holy days, but other than that, we didn't do very much. Mum bought kosher food, but that's because we preferred the kosher meat for, than the taste. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, most of my friends, um, quite a lot of them were Jewish, but I didn't go to a Jewish school particularly. So yeah, I went to synagogue most Saturdays, but that was because you did, not because there was any sort of real faith behind it. Um, and it was sort of compulsory to go to synagogue because they wouldn't be mitzvah for you unless you unless you turned up on a regular <laughs> basis. And, and what happened uh, when you were bar mitzvahed? What happened? What? At the bar mitzvah? Yes. So at the bar mitzvah, it's bar mitzvah is when aged till 12, 13, and you come of age in, in the Jewish sort of sense. And so you become a man. And so there's a ceremony at the synagogue what you actually do is you actually read a portion of the Old Testament and you do it on a huge scroll that they have. And, uh, in my, and they work through, the Jewish New Year works from sort of October to sort of October essentially. And so at the start of the, in October, they start at Genesis and then they'll work through the five books of the Torah over the course of the year. So depending on your, when your bar mitzvah falls, which depends on which bit you got. I was bar mitzvahed in October, so I got started Genesis, the story of Cain and Abel. So you have to read this out yes. to the congregation. Yes, and you say some, you read the Ten Commandments, you say a few prayers, and you have to learn it all off by heart. Because the scroll is like monk script. It's unintelligible to a normal person. So the only way of doing it is to remember it. <laughs> Wow, so I mean, it's a quite a big thing. Yes. And you have to really take it seriously and prepare well. Yes. Oh, I probably spent that a year learning it. And then you are then affirmed. Yes. As an as an adult. Yes. You you. It's a big thing. You have a huge party to celebrate. The mitzvah party. You get lots of nice presents. Um, and then you and then you're a man. And then at that point, it all ceases to be compulsory. From then on? Yes. So in my case, like many of my contemporaries, um, I immediately sort of stopped going to synagogue and stopped practising. But you would still have considered yourself Jewish? I would still have myself Jewish, sort of ethnically, culturally Jewish, but I didn't have um, a faith. So I didn't. If you'd have said to me at that time, do I believe in God? I would have said, Possibly, but if you and if you'd have said to me at that time, what is what what does it mean to be Jewish? You know, theologically, wouldn't have had a clue. No, uh, you were just brought up as Jewish. You were taught Jewish history. It's, it's a very sort of odd thing that you can go to. I remember going to Sunday school well, as, you, as I did for year after year in your run up to your bar mitzvah, and then. But you can come out of it not having a clue about the faith, other than the history and all the tradition and all the ceremony. So what, what was it that began 
a curiosity that eventually led you to Christ? What was that? So that would have been in my sort of mid-30s. So I went from university into a professional job management consultancy and I had a sort of, you know, a well, reasonably well-paid job. And Life what, went what, along nicely. What were you consulting in? So I consulted to a whole range of industries, actually. Um, I went across public sector, the private sector, all different industries. One of the reasons I liked consultancy was the variety of just going into different industries, different companies and organisations, and do and just learning about new things, actually. Um, even went into the military as well, did consultancy with the British Army as well. Yeah, a whole variety. Yes, and, um, and I like that variety. So, and I had a nice lifestyle, went on holidays three times a year, you know, uh, reasonable house, good friends, social life. But then probably in my mid-30s, I probably got to the point where I was starting to say, this is all very well, but there's something missing. And I remember at that time, they're seeing in London, there were alpha boards. The alpha is the sort of evangelistic sort of course run out of Holy Trinity Brompton. And it, there were billboards around London saying, basically around London, I was, said, your life's going well, tickety-boo, but then question mark, something missing. And I thought, oh, that's probably me. Yeah, so that billboard resonated with you. Yes, that billboard resonated. And the other, and so that then started a sort of, there's probably, you could have feel like a little hole in your pit of your tummy. You sort of, um, that's the way I've described it. And, but also, I'd got friendly with two people at my workplace. Um, so I was in a big management consultancy firm who happened to be Christian ladies. And... I started sort of having conversations with them and they, uh, they, they could sense where I was a lot better than I could. I yes. Probably fair to say. Yes. And they invested a lot of time in befriending me, not because they were just trying to get me across the line to become a Christian, but we became good friends. But, I mean, we sat, we'd, have, we'd sit in city wine bars for a for, you know, on Friday evenings after work and uh, have sort of chatting about religion in general <laughs> and things like that and having those sorts of conversations. And they then decided to, they were, they were part of a Christian group at my workplace and they decided to run a workplace alpha course. So that was a different, bit different to the normal alpha course. It was run on a Friday lunchtime in an office in the, in the, where I worked bring out some sandwiches and then yes. run the alpha course. Um, and because that. you'd seen it advertised, it kind yes. of appealed to you. Yes. It didn't convert me at all. So I did the course, um, but it raised a lot of sort of questions. And for me, so I, I was in the world of management consultancy. It's a very head-based profession. It's a very analytical. What you do is you go in and you analyse problems in companies. You look for evidence and facts to come up with solutions. So I'm a very sort of head-based person. So initially, my objections to why <laughs> like God or Christ or Christianity would be, well, where's the evidence? I want proof that God exists, proof that Christ exists, you know, proof that he forgives sins. Um, but what, interestingly, the Lord did to me was that he sort of ignored that and he worked on my heart. <laughs> so he, he said, OK, I'm, I'm not going to get to Terence, if you like, through his head. <laughs> I'm going to get to him yes, through his heart. So I'm not going to argue yes, him into yes. the kingdom. Yeah, I'm not going to argue his kingdom. And the, over about an 18-month period... He slowly worked on my heart. And what the, the thing that most appealed to me about Christianity was the idea of a personal relationship with God. Yes. And the reason I say that more than anything was me, because that was completely 
the opposite to what my experience of God had been in my upbringing. Yes, so our upbringing was uh, more knowing about God yes. rather than yes. knowing God. Yes, so I'm sure if I spoke to a rabbi now, he'd say, oh no, Terence, you, it was all wrong, you had it all wrong. Yes. But for me, there was no concept of, um, in my upbringing, of God being very personal. God was up there, <laughs> very big and important, but you didn't have a personal relationship. Yeah, you couldn't have access to him. Yes, you didn't have access to him. Whereas what appealed to me on my journey, as I sort of thought about it, was having a personal relationship with God. And, and when did that connection happen for you? Well, it happened over about an 18-month, two-year period. And it culminated in a big moment for me. There was a big conversion experience. I know some people can't say, I've always been a Christian, or say, I can't identify when I came to Christ. But for me, there was a moment, 11.30 at night, 6th of February, the year 2000. I'd almost been, probably by that point, sitting on the fence for about three months about whether I did or did not believe in Jesus. And, and the thing that held me back more than anything, to be honest, was what would all my friends think? Interesting. <laughs> because all my friends were non-Christian. Yes. <laughs> so... And was, was I going to be rejected? And of course, I came from a Jewish family. As what, well. As what would everyone think? So they all said, well, so that, that was held me back. Um, but I was sitting in my room. It was a very wild February night. I remember it well. And I was sitting in my armchair and I just had this vision of Jesus at the other end of the room. Sort of like just standing there beckoning me saying, come. So and I decided, when you say a vision, what do you mean? I could see Jesus. In person, the room? Yes. A person sort of at the other end of the room with a smile, holding his hand out, beckoning me. What did he look like? He was wearing, well, he was wearing mid, what I would have thought at the time would have been Middle Eastern robes of, from 2,000 years ago. And, and in sort of, and, and, and he had a beard. And you could see his eyes? Yes, I could see his and eyes. And his face? And his hair, and he had long, straggly hair. Did he speak to you? No. He, he just smiled, and he sort of went, held his hand out, like to say, come to me. And you actually saw Jesus? Yes. So, and, I mean, and, and at that moment, I saw the thought, I'll come. And I sort of I sort of got up out of my little armchair and sort of put my hand out and said, I I accept you. And at that moment, then he disappeared. At that moment? Yes. After so when I accepted, he then disappeared. From me being out of sort of see This her. was eleven thirty. 6th of February, the year 2000. Okay, so uh, how did you process that? Um, how did I process that? I was... I was at the time, I remember just being very relieved and very excited. Relieved that I had come off the fence. Excited that I'd accepted. And I then told my sort of couple of sort of two or three Christian friends who'd been befriending me that I had accepted well the next day I told them yes that I'd accepted Jesus at that point and had an encounter with and, him and I had an encounter with him and did you tell friends at the time that you actually saw Jesus I told those Christians yes and what, how did they react they were excited I can't remember what they I can't remember uh, it's exactly what they said, to be honest, but I know, all I remember then being incredibly excited and incredibly supportive. Has um, Jesus revealed himself to you like that since? Um, I have, I have had one other experience, not where Jesus appeared, but where God did something I would regard as miraculous, 
at a point I asked for something miraculous. Can you tell us what happened? Yes, so I went to Israel. So two years after I became a believer, I got a sense that I should get closer back to my Jewish roots. And I thought, and I, wanted, and I thought I should spend an extended time in Israel. So I decided to take a sabbatical from my work for six months. Oh, you um, took six months off? Yes, I took six months, very short notice. And they obviously allowed that. Well, the, the, this was the God. This is the hand of God because the person at work who I need, I needed to get permission from work. It just so happened that my boss at work was a Christian, who just about understood that I had wanted to spend some time in Israel to get closer back to my sort of Jewish roots. I went to Israel, not having a clue what I was going to do. So I went. Very short. I got permission. Within three weeks, I was in Israel, and I didn't know what I was going to do there. And it was a time. It was in two thousand two. It was a very violent time. It was the Intifada between was yes. at its height. Yeah, there was a lot of bombs going off. Um, I was quite a bit scared. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know anyone there, and I I saw a bomb go off in Jerusalem within the first couple of weeks. Um, it's quite scary, and I was to kill a bit of time. I then thought that I and I was worried. I thought I'd go and visit an archaeological site to kill some time. So I went to this place called Hazor in the north of Israel. It's a great site, lots of Old Testament remains, and it was a very very foggy day. The day I went, if on a clear day, you could see for about 30, 40 miles from it. But I went up there, and I. And I was really uncertain, why was I in Israel? And as I was walking up the steps of this historical site, I said to the Lord, I just need clarity as to why am I here in Israel? What am I to do? Why do you want me here? And just as I just walked up these steps and got to the top of this site, suddenly, and I asked for clarity, all this thick fog just suddenly lifted. And it just became clear. Like within seconds? Yeah, I mean, literally within seconds. It was a staggering. And I was the only one there, because it was a rotten old day. And for about 10 minutes, I could see for miles. And then, and it was just at the point that I'd asked for clarity. And then the fog, for about 10 minutes, the fog just all closed in again. Now, you might say, well, that was a coincidence. <laughs> But to me, at the point that I had asked for clarity, the Lord had just done something, in a sense, to give me clarity. Sure. And it gave me confidence. And the interesting thing was, it gave me confidence to continue staying in Israel, because I'd have to think of coming back home. And then things opened up for me. So I then, <laughs> another interesting thing was, I then got in contact with someone who had met at a conference in London. He was a pastor of a church in Haifa, in the north of Israel. And I thought, I'll give him a ring to see, just go and visit him, to say hello, basically. And when I rang him up, he said to me, oh, that's very interesting you've rung, because I could do with a helper for a few months. Would you, and if you're in Israel, would you like to come and be my helper? And in this church, they, he was writing a book, he wanted help editing, they had a building project going on at the church, they wanted to help project manage, they ran biblical tours around Israel, they wanted help. The guy I wanted help with. So I ended up being this guy's helper for about four months. An amazing experience. And but it's all opened up after the Lord had given me the clarity to stay. Absolutely. And also, interestingly, opened up when I took if you like the step of faith to stay. Because it only opened up once I decided. I said to the Lord, okay, I'm gonna stay here now. Yeah, and actually it was quite a big thing because most people might say, I'm going to have a sabbatical, yeah. I'll take a month off, yeah. or three months off. Yeah. But you went, no, 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 I'm going to take well, six Well, it was a real months. trust of the Lord as well because at that time my company got taken over while I was there and I didn't know whether I was going to have a job. When you got back? To come back to. But, that, the, but the job was held for me. So... When you received Christ and you had that encounter with Jesus, the next day, 
things changed and thereafter? Yes. So for me, it gave a, what did it give? It gave a sense of purpose to life, I would have said. So up to that point, one of the reasons I've been searching was a sense of sort of drifting through life. Things going quite nicely, but just drifting. And what, what, what I found coming to Christ was I got purpose, I had hope, and I had a personal relationship with God and someone to talk to day in, day out, who was there, I could talk to, who I knew who had forgiven me my sins, who was going to offer me return in life, and what I had to do was just follow him. That was the big change. The other big change for me was, I think, in terms of my perspective on relationships with people. That I've been, so I've been brought up, I was an only child, shy only child. I was very independent and self-contained when I went through life. And I was, wherever I am, I sort of like cocoon, my, put a little cocoon around myself, build up a nice little routine, and be that's Terence's little world. But what coming to faith illustrate to, to, to me was, as I started to grow in my faith, was the importance of relationship. Jesus, you know, to Jesus, relationship was everything with his Father and within the Trinity. Love was everything, and that was an art. And the fact that I then had to live that out as part of my faith was a transformational thing. It improved my, interestingly, my relationship with my parents. But how did they react, Terence, how, well, how did when they react? you well, told them, well, I'm I, now a Christian? Well, I waited three months to tell them I'm a Christian, because I wasn't sure what I was going to say. And it was uh, it was quite funny because I they were coming actually they were coming around to my house one day after three months they wanted to discuss some family finance affairs and I thought well I'm not going to let them go at the, at the end of this until they've I've told them and at the end of the half an hour they got up to leave and I said I've got something to tell you and I just came straight out and I said I've become a Christian and they were. Gobsmacked. <laughs> Never expected my it. Mo my mother's first reaction, I remember her words, typical Jewish mother's reaction, where did I go wrong? Yes. <laughs> and, um, and then I gave them a double whammy because I then said to them, which is good, yes, um, the following week I'm getting um, baptised by full immersion, would you like to come? And how did they react to that? Well, I don't think what I didn't, I didn't think they knew what barely what baptism what? was, <laughs> Christian baptism, but they then said a couple of days later that they would come, and then the really emotional thing was that I got I asked my dad if he would hold the towel for me as I came out of the baptismal pool, which he did. He d I, he did. I don't think he knew really what was going on. Really, what was going on. But he held the back, and, and I remember they were very sort of moved when I gave my testimony before you know before the immersion for the baptism as well. So that was a very, and then that, in, I feel like my relationship with my parents then it improved immeasurably over the, the subsequent years. But partly because I probably changed. And they saw the change. And, and that they could see it. Yes, they would comment over time to others that they could see some change. Although it was obviously hard, hard to pinpoint these things, but they could see something. And yeah. so, my, so my relationship got better with my parents, which had been, it had been quite a fairly distant. Well, since then, Terence, You've got ordained. You're yes. a you're a minister, pastor. Yeah. You're a reverend, Terence. For many decades, as a consultant, uh, you would go into situations and companies and fix what's broken. Hmm. The church, 
appears broken. How's that going to be fixed? Well, the church appears broken because it's full of people. <laughs> and we're all broken people, of course. And until Christ returns and we have the new heaven and the new earth. But um, in the interim, <laughs> I think what we've got to rely on is prayer, the work of the Holy Spirit, and the people of God just wholeheartedly following Christ. You're not going to change the church, the worldwide church, overnight. I mean, when I went into large companies, and whenever you go into try and ch deal with a problem in a large company or an organisation, you're dealing with you know, decades of culture, values, tradition, ways of working. The church is that in on an even greater scale. And so no one people or group of people is going to be able to change the church on their own in a sort of man way. We've got to rely on the Lord to be doing that. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, through us praying, through us being listening to the Lord and faithfully following him. That is how we will ultimately get the church to, a, I think, a better place than it is. That's what Paul, in, in his New Testament letters, encourages all the young churches to do, just to faithfully follow Christ and do that, not be sucked into the ways of the world. And that's what he was encouraging them to do. And then when they did that, the church took off spectacularly. And God wants to do that, Terence, doesn't he? He wants to prepare his bride for his return. Yes. And he needs to work in our hearts. Terence, it's been lovely having you on Facing the Canon and sharing a little of your journey of faith. Well, it's been a Thank delight you. to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terence. And I didn't tell you, but Terence is one of my ministers <laughs> at my church. So he's one of my pastors. And I hope that that has inspired you, his story. Um, I didn't know about him, Terence, seeing the Lord. Wow, I'm going to talk to him more about that. But we like to tell stories on Facing the Canon. And we hope those stories have helped you, are inspiring you in your own journey. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join us again.